share. And unfortunately, uh, we see another conference. So I was asked to uh, chair this session. So my name is uh, Shun Lai Chen from the Australian National University. And uh, in this session, we have uh, three uh, speakers. Uh, the first one is uh, Professor Peter Rupert from uh, Western, from the University of Western Australia. Our second speaker is uh, Professor Xiao Lu Wang from the National Economy Research Institute. That's the only uh, private owned economic research thinking tank in China. And he's the faculty director there. And our last speaker in this session is uh, Jane Gori. So you already know her. So I don't need to uh, introduce more. And uh, so each speaker is behind 15 minutes. So because uh, time is really tight, so I hope you can keep your time. And now we are welcome the first speaker, Professor Peter Rupp. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's been a very stimulating morning for me so far. Um, and I hope that what I have to say is of interest to you. Um, so this is going to be a comparison of China and um, India's growth experiences. It's going to be a little bit academic, a little bit uh, historical, but I think um, from looking at the historical data, we can perhaps uh, glean some clues about what it is that's made China its, uh, its economic success, and also um, how close India is, if indeed it isn't close at all, to, um, to China and doing something like uh, what China's currently doing with China. So um, the question is, what can growth economics tell us about uh, uh, similarities and differences between China and India? Um, we're going to look at two things. First, we're going to look at income levels, very briefly, just how rich is India compared to China, and then look at the growth rates. When I come to the growth rates, I'm going to focus on two questions. One is the role of investment. So we've heard a number of people uh, in this morning talk about uh, China being an investment-led economy. It's a, it's a widely held view. I'm going to raise some questions about that view, uh, without necessarily uh, completely disagreeing, but um, certainly want to question what role investment uh, has played in, in China and what the role will be in the future. And then propose sort of a, we look at uh, human capital as well and um, what is taking human capital growth um, help us understand what's been going on in China as well as uh, India. This is a uh, graph showing the GDP per capita in China and in India 2009 from the 10 world tables. So, you can see from this graph that um, right as of now, China is substantially richer, uh, wealthier than, than India, about two and a half times wealthier than India. However, um, this uh, uh, red graph gives the GDP per worker, which is more of a productivity measure, tells how much output is being produced per person who's actually engaged in the labor force. And so China is still substantially richer than India on this basis. That is, it's Potentially more productive than India, but it's not, the gap is closed somewhat when you look at the spaces. So if you believe the Penn World Tables data, then it would tell us that uh, one of the big differences that explains the gap between China and India currently is in fact the, um, is the number of workers per person. That is, India has a very large um, child population, people under 15. These people are not working and they're not in labor force and they need to be supported. That then poses some challenges to India going forward in terms of uh, trying to replicate what China's done with its uh, ever-increasing labor force. Now, um, that's what I want to say about income levels. China is richer, um, though we need to be a little bit uh, careful when we're making these comparisons. Let's look at the growth rates now. So this uh, graph shows data going back to the 19, 1950s. Uh, the top right line, the top line there is, is the United States, just for comparison. And just please take note of the axis here. Uh, it's a log axis, so it's uh, it, that's to make it easier for us growth economists to work out what's going on. But it doesn't necessarily make it easier to you. What it means is that when you get a straight line tracking on like the United States, then it's a constant rate of growth. If you track a constant rate of growth on a graph without a log axis, it would be increasing exponentially like that, and we'd like to see what changes. Right. So we've got a a log axis which helps us compare the growth rates of each of these countries. What you can see there is the green line in India and the uh, purple line in the United States. We've had about the same growth rate ever since the 1950s, except in India you can see there's a slight acceleration uh, down here. 
So right there is where India has been accelerating uh, since about the uh, 1990s. Now China's blue line, and as you see there, China's rate of growth since 1950 has been substantially higher, and it's caught up, it's passed India around about 2000, and now it's sort of it's around two times richer than India. However, this is a, it's got Chinese official data. This is Chinese official data. And there's a number of scholars, including uh, Professor Wu from uh, Hitsubasa University, uh, along with his work with Angus Madison, who've questioned this data. And they've been doing that for a very long time now. Uh, there's other scholars among us, and uh, Ross is here now, uh, who've looked at this sort of comparison and said, well, look at back in the 1960s there, India was uh, supposed to be twice as rich as China in 1950, 1960. And when you look at food consumption, energy consumption, other measures of, of, sort of wealth, it doesn't quite stack up. So the um, more recent data, uh, corrected data, let's come back here, is, is this one. This is a, uh, also from the pen board tables showing China's growth rate since uh, 1950. And what you see there, in 1950 it was much, in the corrected data, India is much closer to uh, uh, China. The GDP is almost the same in 1950. And, um, and the slower growth rate means that China's pulled away, but not many really is dramatically. Now, I've just come back a little bit here. Um, so, for India, we've got a five fold increase in uh, GDP per capita since 1950. For uh, China, in the official, official data, it will be a 19 fold increase in GDP per capita. And when we go to the adjusted Chinese data, we get about a 10 fold increase in GDP per capita. So even after all these adjustments, and sorry, this is GDP per worker, so after adjusting for GDP per worker rather than per capita, adjusting for these uh, official bias and the growth rates, we still get China doing twice as well as India over this uh, long period, 1950 through 2010. Now, why does that matter? Well, it matters for all the reasons we've been discussing this morning, but it matters for one other big reason as well. If you look at poverty rates in China, Right, and poverty rates in India, that uh, doubling of the growth rate in China compared to India it meant a five-fold <coughs> reduction in poverty rates in China compared to a 1.4-fold reduction in India. So this is, uh, Chinese growth is not just about getting richer, it's about reducing poverty, and that's been extremely important in China, and that's why growth in India is extremely important for the economy as well. So why has China grown faster? Well, as I mentioned, that normal explanation focuses on investment because China's investment rates are so high. So let's have a look at uh, Chinese and Indian investment. But before doing that, you might, many of you here might have studied economics, I hope you have, um, and you might remember a solo swan growth model. Now, a solo swan growth model is an extremely simple model, but the basic mechanics of that model underline all of growth theory in economics. It has some basic mechanics and go through into the most more complicated uh, theories. And what all these theories models tell us is that the growth rate of the economy does not depend on the level of investment. The growth rate of the economy depends on the change in the investment rate, among other things, but not the level of the investment. So um, when we look at growth, we need to think about changes in the investment rate, not just the level of the investment. So here's China and India's investment rates going from 1950 through to 2010, the same period. And what you see there is what everybody knows, that China's investment rates are currently very, very high, around 40%, uh, getting up to 45% of this data. Um, uh, India's now uh, very excited about the fact that they're managing to get close to China's kind of investment rate levels, right? Going from here around 2000 to 20% mark, suddenly jumping up to around 30%. But what matters, you can understand the difference in the growth over this whole period, is how much these two investment rates have changed. So for China, you've got a 2.7-fold increase in the investment rate from 1950 to uh, 2010. And compare that to India, it's almost identical. So our simple models of economics tell us that if we look at this data, what we should be expecting is the contribution of investment to economic growth in these two countries to be pretty much the same. They should have added the same amount of percentage points of GDP per year in both countries. Which actually, because India's growth has been lower, would make this increase in investment in India a more important source of growth for India than it is for China. India's had the same amount of investment increase against the lower growth rate overall, means investment's been very important in India, and investment's not been so important in, in China. <clears throat> um, 
Now, I'm actually going to do some sort of a bit of maths here with you. This is a, uh, I, I call this my square root rule. It's not my rule, it's, uh, it's uh, belongs to uh, Solo and uh, Swan. Right? On the left hand side, on your left hand side here, I've got y prime over y. That just means GDP per worker in 2010 divided by GDP per worker in 2019. Right? And on the right hand side, we've got s prime over s, which is investment rate. Uh, now, this is the investment rate then, right? And it's a square root symbol. Now, does anyone know what the square root of 4 is? 2, very good. So, if the investment rate had gone from 10% to 40%, that would be a fourfold increase in the investment rate. And what we'd expect to see from that is a doubling of GDP per worker. But what we know is that Chinese GDP per worker over this period went up tenfold, right? So, the changes that we see in investment, investment rate are a long way from what we, uh, what we um, can, uh, a long way from explaining uh, China's growth. So the 2.7 fold increase in investment rate, which is what we actually saw in China, would only uh, cause a 1.6, about a 50% increase in China's GDP. So that's well, well short of uh, explaining what's going on in China. Now, how much time do we have, Mr. Chairman? Couple minutes. Let's move to, to looking at alternative explanations then. What I want to propose is that human capital might be important. Now, the standard method about thinking about sources of growth um, understates the role of human capital. Because what we know is that when you have a more skilled and more productive labour force, any increases in productivity actually induce capital accumulation. Right? They raise the return to capital and that causes investors to invest more in, in, in capital. So there's a causal link between human capital investment and other things that cause productivity and investment itself. Now this is comparing the um, proportion of the population in China and India that have no schooling. And what you can see in this measure, China is well ahead of India. Right? It's ahead on other measures as well, if you look at secondary schooling rates, primary schooling rates and so on. But just a little note, India's still got, uh, well, <coughs> 40% of the population in India still have no school compared to less than 10% uh, in China. So, potentially then this is an interesting avenue to, to look at. And what you have to do then is take these uh, enrolment rates and convert them into some sort of productivity measure that represents human capital stock. And that's a pretty complicated, controversial uh, exercise. There's a couple of studies here I've mentioned, Barrow and Lee. They look at a whole range of countries and convert these human capital attainment rates into human capital stock measures that we can then use as an input to think about you know, what causes growth. And there's a more recent study that looks specifically at China by Li Fermeni and uh, Li and Wang in 2009. And they've got some new estimates of human capital stocks for China. This is uh, Barrow Li data comparing China and India as a measure of the human capital stock. So if we go with the conventional standard measure that everyone else is pretty much using, uh, doesn't look like there's much action there uh, in the growth rate of human capital stock in each country, nor is there much difference between the growth rates of human capital stock. This is the estimates provided uh, two years ago by this new study for China. Right? We don't have a similar estimate for India, so we don't really know. But what it does highlight is the enormous difficulty in trying to understand how human capital contributes to growth. There are very, very large differences in studies about the extent of growth in uh, the human capital stock. Now this graph here is showing that the, uh, the, the blue line, the light blue line, the alternative measure, an increase in the human capital stock of about 3.8 fold for China. That increase in, cap in human capital stock uh, is, is quite dramatic. <coughs> Uh, but it's even more dramatic than that, so, but wait, there's more. I'm going to throw in three st st state notes as well. Okay. Every increase in human capital stock, remember, induces some capital accumulation. Right? And because of that, this increase in human capital stock in this study is capable of explaining practically all of China's growth since 1985. Okay. So, this is a simulation, for example. The blue line will show the actual growth of China in a computer model that reproduces China's growth since 1985, including all the inputs, investment, human capital, productivity, and so on. And then we do a counterfactual simulation 
hold empty human capital constant. What would happen in China if there hadn't been any growth in human capital over that period? And what you can see there is that, that counterfactual growth of lapses. Now, this is just a simulation, it's just an exercise. It helps us think about the potential importance of human capital uh, in China and understanding what China's uh, achieved and why it's achieved so much more than India. So, let me try and conclude now. Um, the first message from my talk is that getting the numbers right is inherently very, very difficult, right? Um, uh, and even more difficult than that is understanding causation between the numbers. Right? Does investment cause growth? It's easy to assume that, but it's much more difficult to write down a model in economics where that actually happens. What happens is it changes investment, changes, increases in investment towards growth, but a country with a 40% uh, rate of investment would have exactly the same growth rate as a country with a 10% rate of investment. <coughs> Second, the differences uh, in the investment rates between China and India, well, there's practically no differences, so they can't explain the difference in the growth rates. So, um, and lastly, I mean, not lastly, but lastly on this investment point here, is that both countries have got investment rates around about 40% now. To get a, a big increase in GDP per capita in these countries, you want to double that investment rate again, which would be 80%. And clearly that's ridiculous. So neither country is going to make much more gains from increasing their investment rates. Right? Any growth from now on, at these levels of investment, has to come from other sources. So then I put, put a hypothesis to you that human capital accumulations might have been a critical source of growth in these countries. If that's true, then it suggests a couple of uh, interesting uh, thoughts for the future. Firstly, China's going to face challenges in racking up uh, its education system to, um, to uh, accommodate uh, the demands of its, uh, of its growing manufacturing sector. Educating the rural labour force has been talked about this morning already, uh, and so forth. Uh, for India, they've got a perhaps a bigger problem um, because they've got a lot of inequality in the education system, particularly female education levels are low, and as we saw before, still 40% of the population don't have any education whatsoever. So, um, and for India at this time, we said at the very start, India's got a very large um, population of children. Right? So it's crucial that India gets its education system uh, up there to accommodate these children so they can be productive members of the labor force rather than just very popular workers. Yes. Okay, thank you, Peter.
high income people, they are under reporting their income seriously. And the second thing is that uh, the, the official uh, survey samples needs a lot of high income people because when they uh, do the sam uh, <coughs> survey sampling, uh, many high, house, uh, high income people refuse to be interviewed. So uh, uh, as a result, the, the sample is more or less fast. Uh, our survey, uh, the uh, major purpose of survey is to get uh, true information about household income. We sample uh, about uh, close to 5,000 urban households in uh, six to four cities <coughs> in different provinces. Uh, because of the uh, um, uh, survey method we use, it is very different from the official uh, survey. We didn't use the uh, random sampling method because of the uh, in information uh, reliability problems. We use some other method. We, uh, we have several methods to try to control the reliability of the, our data. But uh, we got another problem, uh, is that uh, we cannot directly use our sample to derive the distribution of uh, income between different people. Uh, so uh, we uh, used, uh, instead, we used a modeling method. We uh, estimated the relationship between in income and Angles coefficient. As you know, that angles coefficient means uh, the proportion of uh, a family's food in, uh, food consumption as a ratio to their total uh, consumption. When you have an uh, increasing uh, household income, you will have a decreasing angles coefficient because you will have uh, more money to spend. Um, uh, some other things other than food. So uh, based on this idea, you can uh, estimate uh, the household income uh, according to people's angles coefficient and some other variables because we also found that uh, other variables like uh, uh, different locations, uh, different level of uh, education of the household and uh, different uh, family size uh, also have impact on the angles coefficient. So we control those variables to, uh, based uh, on a modeling work, we uh, derive the, uh, uh, the estimated income based on our information. Uh, that's a model, and uh, that's a result. You can see it's basically got some uh, uh, very uh, significant uh, estimation for our different, uh, for, uh, different variables. These are some simulations uh, for the relationship between angles coefficient and the household income, and uh, we get some, uh, uh, choose some uh, uh, better simulations to use to uh, derive our uh, income. And uh, according to our estimation, we find uh, major differences between our uh, estimate and the uh, household statistics happen to the high income people. Uh, it's better when the top income, 10% of the urban household. According to the official statistics, their income, uh, per capita disposable income in year 2008 was only uh, 40, 43,000 Chinese yen. According to our estimation, this group of people have a per capita household income three times higher. Uh, that's a, that's our, uh, the official uh, comparison between official data and uh, our estimation. Uh, you can see that for this, uh, group, the high, the top income group, they have 
uh, major differences between our estimation and uh, the uh, household statistics. And uh, basically, we, we can find that uh, our estimation and uh, uh, the official data is quite consistent for low income people. For middle income people, our estimation is a little bit higher, but uh, for top income people, there are negative differences. <laughs> Compare with our uh, uh, earlier survey, we, uh, we did our first survey in year 2005. Uh, for that year, uh, we have similar result. We have uh, we found that for the top income 10% uh, of the household, uh, their true uh, income is uh, roughly three times higher than the official statistics. So, uh, what's the distribution of uh, the hidden <coughs> income? I call the differences between our estimation and uh, the official data as hidden income. So the total hidden income uh, as calculated in year 2008 was roughly uh, 9 trillion Chinese yen. 88% uh, of this hidden income concentrated in uh, the top 20% of uh, high income people. Now we have uh, our uh, you can see if you uh, use the estimated data, uh, you can find that uh, the uh, real income gap, the income inequality, much uh, is much greater than what stated in uh, official statistics. Uh, according to the official household data, the urban top income group and the the, the lowest income group each account for uh, ten percent uh, of the household. Uh, they have a difference uh, roughly at nine. That means uh, uh, nine times of the uh, top uh, household income as the lowest income. But uh, according to our estimation, it's 20 becomes 26 times. And uh, if you include rural people in there, you, you, you calculate the uh, income distribution for uh, the, uh, for the national, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the whole nation. So the top ten percent of the Chinese household uh, has a uh, twenty twenty three times higher income compared with the lowest income, according to the official statistics. But according to our estimation. It's 65 times. So uh, uh, the unreported income is large, and uh, this resulted in a much larger income being uh, We need to do some double check with our result. We uh, use a different method, uh, including we uh, calculate, uh, we use the official uh, different type of saving and investment data to calculate household savings, we uh, find that basically they get consistent result with our estimation. Uh, compared with our estimation and the official data, there are different official data. Uh, uh, for the household survey data, uh, we have uh, something uh, around uh, 14 trillion Chinese yen in year 2008. Uh, but according to the flow of funds, they also come from the official statistics uh, bureau. We have uh, 18 trillion Chinese yen, but uh, our estimation uh, uh, suggests uh, 23 trillion Chinese yen of uh, uh, household income in that year. <coughs> That means there are different, uh, there are five trillion uh, Chinese yen differences between our estimation and the official flow of fund data. The flow of fund data uh, come from the national uh, economic census, which is uh, uh, quite complicated uh, information. But uh, uh, income uh, did not. 
was not uh, included in the flow of farm data, we can treat it as green income. That means some income, uh, not only, uh, not only uh, uh, included in the official statistics, but uh, you also cannot identify it's, uh, whether it's legal or not. Uh, you, uh, based on this information, we can find some uh, uh, changes in the uh, national uh, uh, national account. So, uh, for uh, the gross national income, uh, over previously you can see a decreasing trend of household income as a proportion of uh, uh, GNI, that's gross national income. Uh, but uh, also uh, decreasing uh, proportion of uh, uh, labor trends. Uh, according to our estimation, the uh, uh, decreasing trend of household income is slower, but uh, the labor share decreases is faster. Uh, what's the uh, difference? Uh, we can see that uh, household uh, income is higher, uh, but uh, Dropping slowly, uh, the employees' compensation as labor uh, return to labor is low, even lower and dropping faster. The proportion of non-labor income is greater, uh, from close to 10 percent to 24 percent. The additional part is basically what we can call it green income. What's the implication? Uh, first, hidden income or green income is highly concentrated in the, uh, to the high income households. If this leads to a greater income in the inequality, uh, and also it's uh, related to corruption, to a uh, rent seeking behavior, and uh, tax evasion. Uh, and uh, all these things indicate the need of the institutional reform for the uh, official budgetary system, the taxation system, the government administration system. That means further reform are needed. Thank you very much. Thanks, Julian. Um, I think I'll start with an apology to because his name should really be up here. Um, he has written the chapter for the update today. He's from a professor at the United States Studies Centre at the University of Sydney um, and a very high profile writer on the state of the China-US economic relationship. You might expect that he'd be either in the US or China at this time. In fact, he's in Europe, um, hopefully dispelling fears of, of the state of his relationship there. So I am sorry that I'm not him. I'm hoping that you won't ask me too many difficult questions. Um, a little wary of being an Australian presenting for another Australian, although one who speaks with an American accent, about <coughs> the world's biggest relationship, um, one that we thought we just couldn't let the day slip by without making some comments about it. So um, I hope I can do some justice to his presentation and also hoping that the likes of Deborah Browning and Kennedy will be here to field questions on the state of the relationship with my colleagues. Um, I think, and I'm going to speak, you know, as, not as though I was Jeff, but I, I think Jeff, the, my take on this chapter is that he's, he, he comes from a long-standing liberal tradition, that's the little L liberal tradition, which basically places faith in the idea that the economic entanglement of two countries will reduce the probability of armed conflict. And it's for that reason that I would describe his take on the relationship as being like, primarily optimistic. Um, that is that the US, and I'll go straight to this bottom punchline there, which he's asked me to have on both the introduction and concluding sign of the slides, and that is that the US-China relationship is not going to turn into a Second World War, and that is because of China's integration into the global economy, and in particular because of its interrelations economically with the United States. Um, we heard this morning Yi Ping Wang talking about the fact that China does not want to become a G2 system with the United States. What, what Jeffrey says is that China and the US have become a de facto G2 by default. 
And I think that's particularly pointing to the economic relationship with the slow pace of recovery in Europe and the, the, the slow recovery in the US as well, combined with China's resilience in, in sailing through the GFC, that the sheer size of these two economies means that whether they like it or not, their interactions and their combined strength means that they are essentially determining many of the future prospects for the global economy. Um, he's clear, very, I think, emphasises the fact that while China is catching up and then, you know, we have these debates about whether it's number two, when it will become number one, PPP versus, versus more nominal standard measures, um, it is catching up, it is the second largest economy in the world, but in terms of absolute wealth and power, he does point out that the United States is going to continue to be the number one dominant player for a very long time to come. Another point that he makes about the impact of the GFC on the Sino-US relationship, and I guess that's the starting point for the chapter, is that contrary to some expectations, it didn't reduce the imbalances that have become a great source of tension, particularly on the US side. And, and his main argument for that is that there's a, there's a story going on behind the scenes in terms of private sector interdependencies between the Chinese and US economies, and they relate to complex M MNC, or multinational corporation ties. And I've got some lovely illustrations that he provides of, of that. So just a couple of three, three pictures which I think are probably familiar to you all, but I think what stands out to me, looking at this decline in the US trade deficit, and it's leading to the point that he makes that the US-Chinese relationship is different from the relationships that the US has with the rest of the world. And we see that through the 2008 period with a drastic decline in the deficit, the US deficit with the rest of the world, some decline with China, but really pretty minimal and then already picking up again from 2009 onwards. That's, of course, mirrored in China's trade surplus with the US. I think it's even more stark here, that surplus of China with the United States in, uh, above picking up and on the steady increase in very stark contrast with its declining deficits with the rest of the world. And, of course, the, the mirror image of that, which we've heard plenty about this morning, is, is reflected in China's share of US Treasury bills, and that share has risen from just a tenth of total US Treasury bills in 2000 to close to a quarter in 2010. And of course, that is a cause of concern for both the two economies and the world at large. So, he turns to Sino-US economic imbalances, as I've already said, a big source of tension and concern. We heard Lee Gun this morning suggesting that it really is time and imperative for China to refocus its growth inwards in, in, in order to partly appease these political tensions that are occurring across the Pacific. So they have been increasing rapidly in the last decade, and the scale and the imbalance of the bilateral relationship is quite unique, and we see that divide through the post-GFC period. Of course, a, a common complaint or explanation for this in the US is about the manipulation of the RMB being held low to boost their exports and that this is the, 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 the source of the imbalances. Uh, I think he puts forward a very balanced and reasonable view that this simply cannot be the whole picture. And just one slide, again, we've seen some of these figures in earlier this morning, but if it was exchange rate manipulation that explained the entire imbalance problem, then why with a 10% real appreciation in the last five years have we seen a continual, continuing rise in the size of that deficit? So he says that can't be the whole picture, but again, I think he's really balanced in his, in his approach. He says there's certainly an element of truth to the unfair competition critique of China, that you know it's the practices in China that are costing US jobs that are preventing entry into the Chinese market with particular restrictions on, on certain state-owned monopolistic sectors and big sectors like banking, telecommunications, and legal services. Um, also a common, and he recognises a valid complaint of the continuation of IPR infringements on the part of the Chinese. So it's certainly not a, a, an entirely glossy view of, of how China does business. But essentially, he comes down to an, into, a, an alternative explanation, which I think is the take-home message of this chapter, and a, and a really important couple of points to follow. 
He says that the trade line statistics embodied in those trade deficit figures grossly, are grossly misleading and undervalue the benefits of the Chinese economic relationship with the US. His first point, probably familiar to many of you, it's the role of multinationals and joint ventures. With multinationals, i.e. non-Chinese firms, accounting for half of the exports that leave Chinese shores, and a further quarter of those exports being attributed to joint ventures with Chinese and, and multinational firms, which means that essentially only a quarter of those exports leaving China are actually Chinese. And he turns this into what is becoming fairly well known now, I think, a story of assembled in China rather than made in China. And we've got an example of, of Apple to follow. But the other story is that American MNCs are increasingly benefiting from producing and selling into China. So there are two examples that he gives of this, and they're two big ones. One is the Apple iPhone. Um, I won't take up too much time on the details of this lovely slide, except with the point being that a $180 Apple iPhone, um, the, 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 this study has shown that just $6 of the value of that phone is embedded in the output or the added value that's contributed to by Chinese firms. And that contrasts with about $10, I think, of the financing or the costs provided by American components. The remaining two thirds of an Apple iPhone is accounted for in terms of value added by inputs from Japan, Germany and South Korea. And in fact, using this value added approach, he or this study has suggested that rather than the $1.9 billion surplus or, or deficit that the Apple iPhone attributes to the Chinese in the, in the American accounts, that in fact, you could think of there being a $50 million surplus going in the other direction. That's before taking into account the 50% sale or profits on retail sales that take place back on, on US soil. So it's a pretty simple story. It seems really obvious to me, and it, and it raises the question about just how we use numbers to reflect the realities of a, of a changing world. The second story is, is GM, and what he argues is that if you want to think about how GM came out of the global financial crisis, the bailout by the Obama administration, that it should be less about backslacking between Detroit and Washington, and more about what's going on in the, on the Chinese mainland with a joint venture with a, a state-owned company, SAIC, and their rapidly rising sales of cars and trucks inside China. Um, slightly misleading because some of you will have noticed already that the two scales are different there, but still a dramatic climb down to, from my reading, of just between you know two and two and a half million numbers of that's in, in, in sales terms within the US, and it looks like China's just about overtaken in, in, in absolute terms. So there's a big story happening in Chinese on Chinese soil, which again won't be reflected in those baseline or headline grabbing trade statistics. Just a couple of points to go. This um, Professor Garrett doesn't deny that there are challenges and tensions in the relationship, but there are real problems for American firms doing business in China. And for example, General Motors is not allowed to be a full part or have 100% equity or ownership stakes in it in their business. They're still required to have minority a minority share. Um, and there are also, of course, increasing issues of, as we've touched upon this morning about Chinese firms trying to move into US markets and that's particularly related to their state connections or as he says their large, their parastatal nature. Um, there have also clearly been tensions and they happen, we, we, we see them in the newspapers all the time whether on tariffs or currencies and of course those, those tensions spread into the geopolitical realm as well. But according to Professor Garrett, none of those skirmishes are out of control. In fact, he sees them as a pressure valve, just releasing some of the tension that is inherently about domestic problems in the United States and in, and in China themselves, and with more of a political manoeuvre to ensure that the people are kept happy by a little bit of blame game going in both directions. None of those are out of control. Instead, what you've seen in, I guess he talks about the last five years or the last decade is a cool heads behind closed doors, softly, softly economic diplomacy. And I think here where there's a great lesson for Australia is that essentially he's arguing that 
it's the strong leadership in, on, on both sides of the relationship that has really enabled them to steer through what could otherwise be rather tense times. The wrap up for, for the chapter is that the century that we're in and that we're heading towards is, is an Asia Pacific century and I'm sure for, for Jeff that includes China and the US and not China growing up and, and overtaking. That's just not going to happen in the time frame that he's interested in. He recognises profound differences in values and interests between the two countries and also this deeply unbalanced economy, economic structure that causes problem, but also emphasises just how codependent the two largest economies have become. But I guess the bottom line is that the economic benefits of the relationship, this great bilateral relationship of, of the 21st century are immense, and that on both sides they can see that the costs of any real conflict would be catastrophic, and that that's enough in this liberal sort of strain of thinking to, to keep the cooler heads keeping real leadership and ensuring a, a, a relatively stable relationship in, in the years to come. So he again emphasises from the first page to the last, we're not talking about, or well, he's not putting money on any kind of second Cold War, and it's thanks to the economic integration of the two countries that he concludes with that point.
lead from what happened. Um, can it be due to planning? Well, um, you know, China, India was also a very social state in the 1960s. Um, we've got an intervention, a lot of control. Um, what I think is that, uh, as I said, I think literacy has been very important, basic education is very important in China, and, and the egalitarian nature of that, and in part that is due to, to planning. Right? So, you can certainly look to planning and say, well, I'm looking for some other things, that's very clear. On the other hand, the great famine also came out of planning, right? Um, India had its share of famines before it came as well. So, um, there's this plus and minus, it's, it's always good to have a good patient, it's a nice and benevolent one. Um, and so I think uh, uh, China's been fortunate to have, by and large, especially in the last 20 years, a benevolent, benevolent plan, which is uh, by and large made more good decisions than the best way I can probably do to answer that question. But with this, we mean that I recommend that as a model for future, future economies. Um, it's also true, of course, that democracy is, uh, does slow those kind of big investment pushes that China's been able to undertake. Democracy slows that thing a little bit. Um, although they've got to share with muscle with their regular exercise as well, so that's partly political power as well. Um, yeah, there's just about looking across states and developing capital. Of course, a number of scholars are looking at that kind of issue uh, right now as well as uh, things like returns to being able to speak English um, and uh, inequality and so on. Um, but it's ongoing research, I don't think it's any clinical. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I might just um, haven't fully form formulated a thought about the, the question about the Chinese versus the Indian development model. It's obviously a huge question. There's enough debate and we could spend a whole day just thinking about the Chinese development model and this question of how much of it is state-led and how much of it is to do with the opening up to market forces. What has it meant to have it a, a non-democratic party in, in control of the show and, and, and increasingly possibly losing control of the show. I actually think it relates back to Deborah's discussion um, in Africa and what the Chinese are doing in Africa there. She referred to the Chinese developmental state model. Again, it's, very, it's a highly debated issue to what extent has China's development and growth been the consequence of this developmental state. At, at, the, at the break after that, I had people asking me whether or not Australia could be learning about China's methods in, in Africa and could be doing a better job you know, of our own aid commitments by following something more akin to the Chinese model. Um, so I don't know if Deborah has any comments also on that, but that idea of the developmental state, um, there'll be others in the room who I, I suspect might disagree on the extent to which that's determined China's growth. Um, on this question that is really for, for Professor Garrett and not for myself, um, I, I think it's very true that the American population is probably largely uneducated about Australia. We have the same problem in, uh, sorry, about the, about the Chinese, and I think we face this same problem in Australia of trying to educate people about the very nuanced situation that, that we see in the Chinese economy and, and the, the population at large. Um, I think the point would be that at the, at the very highest level, there's some very sophisticated negotiations going on, that there are much deeper understandings than we might sometimes otherwise think, and that then how that transmits through the two, the two societies, I guess, very different. The Chinese have their media control and ways of kind of controlling, just not controlling what the populace think, but influencing that to some extent. But ultimately, at the, at the end of or what we see of the state of the, situ of the relationship at the moment is that it's that top level, very clever negotiations that are actually keeping, keeping the relationship on track. And I think, again, there's a message there for, for Australia we need strong leadership, um, and I'm not necessarily sure that we're seeing that, but to have strong leadership on where that relationship would have and that cool head, softly, softly approach might, might do us some good to actually start looking at how those two great giants are managing their own relationship and learn a little bit from that for ourselves. Okay, so. Okay, I call the second round. We still have some time. Uh, another three questions. Okay. The lady. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Thank you.
Okay, you, you, you can do first. Okay. Thank you. Oh,
those ideas are um, and I've national ideas and international ideas for export and, and the whole world have benefits from those those ideas. I don't no further comments there. Just in, just so that you know it's not a publishing error, we've had Xiaolu Wang today speaking about his great income and um, it was partly because he is one of China's leading experts on inequality and we thought it was too good an opportunity to let go. He's actually written a paper for the book on an international perspective on China's urbanisation, so quite a different topic. Um, but it even just the links back into Ross's question about this GDP, whether it translates into a national accounts problem, I think it's a really important one. You look at the, the, the size of the numbers that Xiaolu is suggesting that these statistics are out by has implications obviously for the extent of inequality within China, which then links back into how this rebalancing of growth is going to work, but it also depends on whether they're spending or saving that money, which in turn I think feeds into obviously the inflationary pressures within the economy, the pressures on these capital controls and whether they're actually managing to break outside of the system. And so it really does, if the numbers are, are accurate, and even if they're out by five trillion, I think we're still talking about an extra five trillion dollars floating around that, that could have meaningful implications well beyond the inequality that it presents for the Chinese economy. So I hope you'll agree with me that it was a that, it, that it's that it's more relevant to the to the today's discussions than you might have at first thought. <laughs> Okay, I think the Q&A time is over, and it's time for the really good questions. And uh, before having tea and coffee, so let's uh, thanks to our three brothers.